job and uh, to the communities that you serve. I think it's very important and I think maybe uh, since probably since March we have been counting days and how many days we have been uh, a little bit isolated. But uh, what I want you to do uh, from this day forward is to make every day count. And one of the things you could do is consider uh, putting some of your time and energy in uh, looking at these uh, requests for applications and actually putting a proposal together. Uh, I'm here with my team and I'm gonna uh, let them introduce themselves, uh, starting by uh, Kellyanne. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kellyanne jones -Jamp Guard. Um, I'm a, the program specialist for the Hispanic Serving Institutions Program. So please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or comments um, related to the program and your grants. Thank you. Dorisel? Hello, my name is Dorisel Resto. I am a new program specialist for insular areas. Welcome and thank you for joining me, Tos. Chinaru? Hello, my name is Chinatsu Gladwich and I am a program specialist here at NIFR. Okay, and uh, I just wanna give, uh, start by giving a shout out to uh, the team because uh, this is uh, possible because they have been working really hard in reaching out to you and getting these uh, presentations uh, together. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, the Main two contacts for the HSI program, uh, it's, this is the two of us, Kellyanne and myself. So feel free to reach uh, to us and ask us any questions that you might have regard, regarding the RFA. But we're gonna do such a great job today that you might have very limited questions. However, we're happy to discuss any potential ideas. And I, I see uh, 156 people sign up for uh, being part of this meeting. Uh, if we all get our propo proposals in, uh, every 10th of you, one every 10 people, uh, you'll be getting funded. So I encourage you to apply to this uh, grant program and the other grant programs that we're gonna uh, let, uh, make you aware of. Next slide. What we're gonna do today is uh, just give you a brief introduction to USDA and NIFA, uh, talk about the 2021 HSI request for application, give you some tips for a successful uh, grant uh, application, and then we're gonna uh, leave some time to uh, answer some questions. Next slide. Uh, we are the uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and uh, we're part of uh, one of 29 agencies at USDA. We are under the, uh, the mission area of research, education, and economics. And we are the principal extramural arm of USDA. That means that our main work and almost all the work we do it's not done in-house, but we actually give grants to all of you to actually conduct the, uh, the work we do. USDA budget is $1.151 billion. We have the opportunity uh, to uh, use $1.6 billion. In Missouri, uh, since uh, fall of last year. Uh, next slide. Again, all these 29 agencies were one of them. Uh, again, we are on the day on the secretary for research, education, and uh, economics. And our sister agencies are uh, the uh, ERS, Economic Research Service, National Agricultural Statistical Service, Agricultural Research Service, and we have Office of the uh, Chief Scientist House also at, under this mission area. Next slide. And uh, what we do, it's we do it in. in it, what we do is use all this money, this 1.6 million dollars, 
to invest in uh, advanced agricultural research, education, and extension. And what we're trying to do is give you this money through grants to actually solve all societal uh, challenges. Next slide. Uh, NIFRA priorities uh, uh, in the science areas. And we think, oh my goodness, I am at a two-year college. I might not have a bioeconomy, bioenergy, bioproducts program, but all the programs that you serve, all the math, the science, uh, the biology, they might have something to do are the building blocks to all these programs from agroecology, uh, agroclimate uh, science to actually youth development. So all, we all share uh, these priorities. We're all interested in food safety. We're all interested in human nutrition. Uh, we all are interested in making sure we live in a healthy environment uh, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Applying for NIFA grants. Many of you, and if you haven't done anything about this, uh, you need to make sure that you register with grants.gov, uh, you're registered in the SAM system, and so you can actually submit an application. There's an application guide in, on the internet, and we're giving you all these resources that you could uh, reach to. One of the things we plan to do is, if you're interested, we're gonna send you uh, the PowerPoint, so later on, you could actually click to these links and uh, get the information uh, from the website in writing. Uh, one, of, one of the things that is important is that when you're applying, that you submit a complete application. Uh, sometimes we're in a hurry and we for, for, uh, forget to uh, include certain parts that are essential, and then that disqualifies you from uh, from competing, from competition. And all, all documents must be in PDF format. That is very important. Um, okay, yes. Uh, next slide. Um, applying for the grants. On this slide, we actually send you to the link on our website and to the application and to the RFA. It's very important that you read the RFA. We try to give you the most important things here during this presentation. However, it is very important that you read the details. Next slide. Deadlines. Uh, deadlines are approaching. You have about uh, two months to complete these applications. Uh, we have different dates for the different type of grants uh, or type of projects. Drago grants January 26, January 27 for the collaboration, and the conference grant is January 28th. All grants are due at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we have about $10 million uh, for all these grants. And uh, Please make sure uh, that you make a note on the Eastern Standard Time. So if you're in California, there's, some, you know, there's a few hours of difference. It's, it's, it's not five o'clock in California or Puerto Rico or Texas, it's uh, Eastern Time. Thank you so much. Um, next slide. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure uh, that you think of, make sure you're eligible and you can prove that 25% of your uh, undergraduate full-time Hispanic enrollment is Hispanic. If you have a letter from the Department of Education uh, certifying you, that'll be great, you could include that. Another thing I wanna really, really remind you is that those uh, interesting program codes and CFDAs are important. These two uh, program codes, the NJ, takes you to the panel for uh, the HSI program and the CFDA. So if you put the wrong code and instead of putting NJ, NJ, you put NA or NT, it will take you to another grant program and we will not have the ability to access that proposal. So keep in mind those program codes when you're filling the application, whoever is entering the information in the system uh, needs to know uh, this information. Next slide. Again, 
What are we trying to do with HSI monies? What we're trying to do is attract and support undergraduate and graduate students from under, underrepresented groups for careers in the food, agriculture, and natural science. We are trying to enhance your ability and the quality of the education you provide in food and agricultural sciences. Many people ask, well, do I need to have a food and ag science programs? And the answer is no. The whole idea is that we're trying to bring food and agricultural sciences to your institution. So perhaps uh, if you have an, uh, the, you, you teach in economics, you could uh, have a degree in uh, ag economics or add classes that relate to agriculture in, in ag economics um, and, and things like that. Water quality out of your uh, chemistry department and things like that. How could we include food and agriculture into the offerings that you have and expand your offering and strengthen your offerings if you already have some? We're trying to uh, uh, provide access to opportunities and careers in the uh, agriculture and how could we get the students ready to uh, fulfill and, and be successful in these careers. Um, we also trying to make sure we align some of uh, HSI's and nonprofit efforts in supporting academic development and, uh, and attainment of underrepresented students. Next slide. Uh, food and agriculture and sciences. Here is a whole long list of uh, potential disciplines in food and agriculture from rural human ecology, uh, home economics, aquaculture, uh, big data. These are things that we are interested in. And you might be thinking, well, I'm located in the city. You know, does that, um, you know, is there something that relates uh, uh, in, in agriculture to what we do? Yes, because there's also urban agriculture and many of the environmental concerns and uh, food safety, et cetera, et cetera, are, are related to the people in, in, in that lives in uh, urban areas. Next slide. Uh, we have uh, some need areas identified and I call it the building blocks because if you were to have a good curriculum, great faculty, good, you know, really good instructional delivery system. You have the right equipment to teach the students. You give them opportunities for the students to learn. You actually recruit them and retain them. You're going to have a great program and you're going to have excellent graduates. Next slide. Um, one of the three uh, types of grants is called the regular grant. The regular grants you could get uh, up to $250,000 uh, here's where you uh, do a project and you work either by yourself or you have uh, other partner institutions, but the main focus of the project is your institution. You might have other institutions that are not HSI. They might have uh, nonprofits. You might have the industry working with you, but, uh, it, but it, it, it's up to you. The time frame for uh, this project uh, type is 48 months, and there's no limit of the number of regular applications submitted per institution. So if you want to submit 10 applications, that will be fine. Uh, just don't make sense, send the same one 10 times. Um, next slide. Uh, we're asking if they, that we're keeping the time frame to 48 months. Basically because uh, most of the time or uh, 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 over the last 20 years, almost everyone had needed the 48 months. There's another subtype of the regular uh, grant. It's, it's, this is an institution, you know, and, and you can raise your hand if you want in, uh, on, on, the, um, on the chat. Um, if you're a new institution that had never received funds from uh, the HSI Education Grants Program and um, you're really trying and you have a great idea, uh, but however, the, the panel doesn't, doesn't uh, rank it high enough to fund it. However, the panel believes that you have uh, the potential for, for doing the project, we will uh, consider you as a bridge grant, we consider 
funding you as a bridge grant and the, fund, the funding decreases a little bit to $200,000. So if you are one of these institutions that have never been funded, please, please, please consider, uh, make sure you write a sentence on your application saying uh, you wanna be considered for a bridge grant. Next slide. Uh, the collaboration grant. Those are the larger institutions and um, um, the larger grant and uh, in the sense of budget, it's $1 million totals for the four years. And uh, we have asked you to have two or more HSIs working together. And the whole idea is, is to uh, connect the institutions, connect the students from the two year to the four year, from the four year to the master's level and the PhD level. We expect for you to, out of this project, recruit a minimum of 15 students at the undergraduate level and, and plus uh, 10 graduate students either at the master's or PhD level. So we uh, restrict the number of applications per institution to two in this level and we are making awards, new awards to institutions that do not have a collaboration grant open. That means it's still uh, current and within the four years. Uh, we anticipate two to four awards depends on the, depending on the ranking uh, of the panel. Okay, uh, next slide. Conference grant, this is a smaller uh, uh, grant and the whole idea is to bring together educators and talk about a topic, a, a, a need in the area, a need in the community. It could be a, a need for uh, water uh, quality, a need for developing organic agriculture in the area, animal science, it's up to you. Uh, all HSIs are eligible and indirect cost is not allowed. In this case, the um, in, in this case, the time frame is uh, three years. And no more than two applications for uh, per lead institution. Next slide. Every year, we, you know, we, you might have five applications and we're all, you know, based on those guidelines that I just mentioned, um, <clears throat> but we only make two awards per institution. And this is, we have, we have over 500 institutions and what we're trying to do is make sure uh, we cover the larger amount of institutions uh, that we have. Okay, um, and this is per year. Okay, uh, there is no matching requirement that was removed a couple of years ago. And we encourage you to partner with an USDA, USDA agency for the application. You could contact us, you could contact your uh, liaison and, and, and see if they could help you connect uh, with one of the agencies of USDA. Uh, and the whole idea, if you're working rangeland management, or, or you know, you work with National Resource Conservation Service, or if you're uh, developing a, a program in, in, in forestry, uh, we connect to, with the forest service and, and so on and so forth. The whole idea is that you know and what USDA is doing, what the intentions are, what the programming is, what the jobs at USDA and the agencies at the community they work with are, but they also get to know you. So what we're trying to do is, is establish win-winning, uh, uh, win-win relationships. So, so you, could, uh, you could get to know USDA, USDA gets to know you and your students. Next slide. Uh, duration again, it's, it's four years and the statutory time limit of all these grants is five years. So um, after the fourth year, you could request a no cost extension, but the money, all of them must be spent and withdrawn within the five years because the monies expire and they go back to the treasury. So, uh, so don't, you know, it's important that as you use the money, you withdraw the money. So 
you don't come into the situation where uh, uh, the fifth and uh, fifth year anniversary of your uh, award comes along, and you haven't withdrawn the monies, and once that timeline passes, there is nothing NIFA could do. Okay, so that's something very important. When they're when the award is filed, you should have been done with everything. Okay, going back to uh, indirect costs. Uh, you need to use your negotiated rate, but it, it, it's not supposed to exceed 30%. The agency Congress has capped indirect costs at 30% for all, uh, about all NIFA grants. Next slide. And what we're trying to do here is a, a simple model. We get uh, funds and at USDA th uh, through NIFA and we give uh, funds for the HSIs uh, for Hispanic serving agricultural colleges. And those are those institutions that uh, our HSIs actually do have a four year or two year program in agriculture. And 15 of the students that graduate from this program uh, are uh, Hispanic. We're trying to uh, get you to train the students, uh, help them get internships at USDA, uh, have them graduate, and some of them come back and get to get placed at USDA. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, the application. Uh, please go and see the RFA on pages 13 to 22. Uh, you have one page for the summary page, project narrative, it's a limit of 25 pages, double space. Um, so, um, so please make sure, uh, make sure you are within limits. The, the uh, reviewers are not required to read more than those 20 pages, double space, plus up to five uh, pages in figures. Make sure you budget the management plan, the expected outcomes. And if you're a resubmission, please make sure uh, you include a uh, one page response to previous, uh, the previous comments from the reviewers. And then again, uh, look at all these potential advanced education, proposed approach, all these things are things that must be included uh, in the application to be a successful application. Next slide. Evaluation criteria, uh, very, uh, very, very important. How are they peer review uh, gonna look at your application? So the first thing they're gonna read it, it's, is this application has the potential for advancing the quality of education? You know, what is the significance of the problem? And, and the question you're answering here is, so what? So we give you $250,000. Uh, what changes are going to happen in your institution? You know, what are we going to get out of this project? Um, so the other thing is the proposed approach and cooperative linkages. So um, who are you working with? Who is helping you? Who do you need? To be working with you. It's your dean supporting you and you know some of the things that include here is the letter of uh, support. You know like sometimes applications come and there's not one letter of support included. Sometimes they have a few letters of support but there's no letter of support from their own institution. So, so those things are important. Another thing that is important is the uh, institutional capa uh, capability and capacity uh, uh, building up uh, uh, within your institution. Um, so, you know, what, what, what are, are these things uh, important? Because we wanna make sure we give you the money to do something, you actually have the capacity to carry it out. The same thing with the key personnel. We wanna make sure that the personnel is qualified. It doesn't matter if it's a new faculty or a, a more experienced faculty, are they qualified to do the job? Um, budget and cost effectiveness. Uh, dear applicants, uh, the people that come and read these proposals are just faculty and administrators just like you. 
and they will see that if you're charging $5,000 per laptop for the program, they know that it's a little bit inflated. So try to be cost effective, try to serve the larger number of students and make sure this is uh, the project that I'm proposing is worth investing money in. After all, this is Uncle Sam's money and we wanna make sure it's spent the best it can. And believe me, the reviewers do take, care, uh, do take notes on how well the budget uh, is spent and how cost effective your project is. Next slide. Um, the application and life cycle. One of the things uh, we get asked uh, over time is um, when, you know, when we will know about the results. So as you see here, it's a somewhat complicated, uh, uh, good number of steps that we have to go through uh, doing the application. Uh, so we're recommending that uh, you start the activities uh, late August, uh, uh, early September, late September. So do not plan to have uh, access to the, you know, the monies and everything and the no award notice is gone out uh, much earlier than that. One thing is important as, in, as, as important of making sure you have the uh, correct program code. Is it important that you are going to receive a grants.gov confirmation email, but within 30 days of the deadline, um, you are going to receive a, an email from NIFA telling you that, um, that we received at NIFA your application. If after 30 days from the time uh, you applied on the deadline of that deadline, you have not received a NIFA confirmation email, please contact us because there is something wrong with your application. And there is no way that we will be able to know that there's something wrong with your application if you actually do not uh, contact us to let us know. Okay, next slide. Uh, there's some here, some resources for a successful application. Again, everything must be in PDF. Um, there is a, the third bullet here talks about a supplemental information for HSI program. This is a good document to read. Uh, it used to be part of the RFA, but as we're trying to make uh, the RFA is a little bit more compact, we made these uh, some supplemental information. And what it does, it gives you some guidance um, on, on, on things that you might have questions uh, about. Next slide. One of the things that is important for you to know is that uh, the current circumstances are different from two years ago. So when you are developing this project, make sure you have a plan B. It's, it's make sure that you could work within the current circumstances and could implement the project. So for example, if you were to gonna include experiential learning, one of the things we love to fund, uh, make sure that there's a, you follow the, you know, the necessary protocol to make that happen, or do not plan these activities for the first year, maybe year three, two, three, or four will be the best ones to do that. So I think that is important. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, is that we have certain guidelines and, and uh, certain exceptions that we're uh, implementing due to coronavirus. So if you ha you have currently have a grant and you're having trouble implementing your project, do not wait too long. Look at these resources. Give us a call. Let's see how we could work to make sure um, make sure we could carry out the project. And for example, I had somebody call me and said, well, we wanted to do a meeting and we're gonna bring all these group 
and we're going to be training the students or the faculty in this uh, topic. And one of the things they couldn't do because they couldn't meet. Uh, they were supposed to travel and do all these things. So that got canceled out. However, what they did is, well, let's record them. Let's do a Zoom meeting, provide them uh, some materials and, and have these. And uh, even more, let's go and record it. So they went from having a live meeting to having a Zoom recorded meeting. And at the end, one of the things they were able to do is actually, uh, they were able to serve more people because the meeting was recorded and other people could go and watch the recording. So, you know, we're, we're during trying times, things are difficult to get done. How can we get a little bit creative to make things happen, to actually turn these difficult times in a better opportunity for our institutions and our uh, students? So, um, okay. So I know you have a few questions here on the chat. Uh, okay. Kellyan, you wanna talk about the other funding opportunities? Or I, I could just go through these. Yes. Sure, I can do it. Um, so yeah, we just have a few slides with just upcoming opportunities um, that we'd like to just make you aware of. So this slide has just a table of other NIFA funding opportunities that may be of interest um, at, to your institution. So please feel free to, after we send this out, to forward to other faculty or other colleagues that may be interested. So we have the um, Women and Minorities in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Fields Program. Um, the purpose of that program is to increase the number of women and minorities from rural areas, and that's a K-14 opportunity. Um, SPECA, which is in the middle there, the secondary education, two-year post-secondary education and agriculture in the K-12 Classroom Challenge Grants Program is also a K-14 program. So especially for those of our um, co community college uh, to your college partners, those may be of particular interest. So the Biotechnology Risk Assessment Research Grants Program, BRAG, um, which is more of a research-based funding opportunity. And then I know we have a few members on the call from Puerto Rico. So you are also eligible to apply for the Insular Area Grants Programs. And you can see both of those listed and we will have a webinar about that program later today and a recording of that and the PowerPoint will also be available to our um, friends from Puerto Rico if you're interested in that program. And then lastly, um, there's also the Higher Education Challenge Grants program. There will be a webinar tomorrow for that program. And again, we'll make sure the, um, the recording of the webinar and PowerPoint is available um, if there's interest for that program as well. And just a reminder to check the NIFA calendar frequently as Funding opportunities are frequently posted there. Um, another upcoming event um, is December 9th um, at 1 to 2.30 p.m. Central Time. And this will be a webinar that is moderated by myself and Carlos Ortiz, the previous program specialist um, for the HSI program. And we will be talking about uh, applying to NIFA competitive um, education grants programs as small and mid-sized institutions. And we will have panelists um, from the Hispanic Serving Institutions Education Grants Program. So one of our projects from Austin, um, the Austin Community College Program will talk about their grant, um, the Research and Extension Experiences for Undergraduates Program. Um, we'll have two different projects represented from that group. And then the Professional Development for Ag Literacy Program will also um, be represented. And so if you have any interest in learning more about those programs, um, the, I will make sure to send out the registration link. So feel free to pass that along as well. And the, the registration link should be on the, um, on the calendar, at NIFA calendar too, right? It is, it was posted Remember yesterday. Remember I mentioned that we, at NIFA we have $1.6 billion and we have about $10 million is, um, it's, it's, it's for the HSIs. Well, think about uh, over a hundred million dollars of opportunities that are available to small and mid-sized institutions. Uh, and you could get, learn more about that 
uh, attending these uh, webinar. Okay, so next slide. We're, we're about done. Uh, okay, volunteer to be a reviewer. One of the best ways is uh, to, feel, to know how does it feel to be inside the cage of the lion is getting inside of the cage of the lion. So uh, terrible uh, comparison, but however, I wanna encourage you to be, uh, to submit your uh, CV, your resume, to be a reviewer. Not exactly for the HSI, but for a, uh, any of the other grant programs. And what it does, it gives you an insider's view of what happens. Um, sometimes we write a document, a proposal, and we think it's perfect. And we read it and reread it and we think, oh my goodness, there's nothing wrong with this. It must be funded. However, when it comes to the panel, other people have different views, different uh, positions, and they, they look at the proposal in different ways. So al allowing you the opportunity to actually do that and tear apart and put together other proposals, uh, it, it gives you some inside information on how is the best way to write an application. It also gives you the uh, opportunity to uh, network with us and network with other uh, researchers and educators towards, uh, in, around, around the United States. It's very interesting because, I mean, Zoom, Zoom is changing the way we do business. Um, and uh, I thought when we have a panel via Zoom, it's not gonna be as um, productive and, um, and engage as, as it is when you're alive. Of course, there's some differences, but however, the ability of uh, the reviewers to engage in great conversations and discuss the proposal, it, it has been very surprising and very pleasing to see that the, the process goes on and the peer review could be very effective uh, when it's virtual. The next slide. Um, Dr. Lawrence, I've seen, I see that Dr. Zanatel has joined us, so we can go back to her slide to okay. give her the floor to describe her projects to us. Oh, and as you go through, uh, uh, I, I, we have chosen these two projects because they, they are, are changing their communities. So um, uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Brooks Santel. You ready? You're muted. Oh, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much, Irma, and uh, really, and Kellyanne, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with others a little bit of some of the lessons that I've learned in applying for these grants. And it's been a long road, so um, it's really rewarding to hear uh, Dr. Lawrence describe this project as changing lives because it, it is changing lives in our area and we're really, uh, it's amazing how it's had um, some ripple effects that, that uh, keep growing, but um, that's just uh, fruits of some labors and it's, it's been a, a long process, uh, actually starting in 2012. So you might notice that um, it says that the first uh, grant that I was awarded was in 2014, but I actually started applying for this program in 2012 and I'm going to direct my comments to people. Uh, there might be some of you who have applied for many grants and are familiar with the federal grant process at the institutional level. I'm really going to direct my comments for people like me in 2012 who were total newbies to the process and every single aspect of it was like a giant um, learning curve and was for 
uh, over uh, several years of learning actually and I feel like I'm finally hit my stride and <laughs> actually like feeling like I kind of know what I'm doing uh, when I put together a grant, grant application at this institutional level. Um, but I, I wanted to just, I'll try to kind of move through quickly with the things I wanted to share. So one thing I've learned is that prior to this, my only experience in getting grants was as a graduate student. So I had applied for plenty of grants and gotten awarded uh, different opportunities through those applications. So based on that experience, I had no idea that applying for a grant at this level, an institutional level grant, especially between institutions, it's a huge process and it takes a long time to bring the pieces together. So one thing I would say is that um, I thought, for example, that a month was plenty of time and actually um, it, I would say like you need even longer than that. Um, some people I know start planning these kind of things six months in advance. So start um, in advance with as much time as you can. And uh, there's a few reasons for that and I'll get to those along the way. But start early and the best place to start is actually with the, um, the request for applications study that thing like you're going to take a test on it because it is the guide or at least that's been my guide i i've studied it to figure out what is the area of priority concern that that they are looking for projects in where does what i could do fit so i use it as a total guide i've got mine um highlighted underlined uh, and it guides you through exactly what you need to uh, include in your written proposal, the order that it needs to follow, and it tells you very clearly what they are looking for, and it even references certain literature and reports that are important to them that uh, um, outline goals or um, uh, some statistics and data that have meaning relevant to the project. And when I think it's important to, um, uh, to let them know that you're paying attention to what they're asking you to do. And so I incorporate some of those uh, reports that they mentioned that were important enough to them I look them up, I look at where they have referred to, what pages, and sometimes those end up being uh, citations in my propo proposal and help me to think through some of the goals in my proposal and ways that they align with those objectives. So I'm looking for ways that what I'm proposing to do can align with what they're saying are their, that USDA NEPA is saying is what they want us to be doing with their investment of money. So I really study that thing to get the RFA to really get a sense of, of where I'm headed and what it is it about what my school and my situation, what is it that we can bring that I'm excited about or that you're excited about that you know that you could do with this investment of money that, um, that fits with what they're going for and that you you have a passion for and that excites you because you're going if, if it gets funded you are going to end up pouring a lot of your life energy into pro implementing the program that you lay out on paper and in the budget and so I think it's really important that you you're excited about it and that it's something that you care about because it very much is going to be something you spend a lot of your time doing and the rewards of the impact on the students have to be great enough to outweigh the amount of time it takes and there's a ton of paperwork and a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on um, in in implementing the program once it's actually awarded. So the work just begins when you get the award. So study your 
RFA and let that really guide you. I also, they asked for a logic model and I did not have the slightest clue what a logic model um, was prior to this. So they actually have, I don't know if you can see me, um, it doesn't matter if you can't, but I'm holding up that um, USDA has a, a generic logic model for need for reporting that's available on their website. Um, I think that the RFA references how to get to this, but this is basically exactly this is what I built into the template I used to build the logic model that I turned in for our project. And um, that was another hugely intimidating step and which took a lot of time and just kind of studying like what what are what's the difference between inputs and activities what is knowledge versus conditions but they have examples of here of, of what they mean by these different um, categories and really if you follow their examples but think about your world and your project it'll help guide you um, as to how to break down your project between sort of activities versus things that you can measure quantitatively like the number of degrees that will be the outcome of students completing degrees can go more in this outputs or uh, I guess it's called outcomes area but you do have to put that together as a guide and it takes time but it is also a roadmap in a sense to you because it's taking your 20 page proposal and distilling it into a one page sheet the other piece that um, kind of caught me off guard, and I think these are common sort of rookie mistakes, is that I was 100% clueless about um, what it was going to take to even submit the proposal. So I thought I could write the proposal and that would be the lion's share of the work and really that was just one aspect of it, um, was coming up with the ideas and how it meshed with their RFA. Um, what I didn't realize was that I put all this work into a proposal and the only thing that anybody wanted to look at was the budget. And boy, do people want to look at the budget. They get out uh, magnifying glasses that are like, uh, as, as powerful as the most powerful microscopes out there to look at your budget to see every detail of whether or not um, what are you planning on doing with the money is it allowed for you to be able to do that with the money and also the your institutions the of higher education the people that review your budget the very first thing that they look at is whether or not you have put in enough money for them um so i thought that we were going to get uh like all this money from the usda to do all these great things and then all of a sudden it's like you know like oh my god actually like your home institution is planning on taking a big chunk of that money and they have their justifications for doing that to run that facility and to provide the support to you but finding out simple things like what is the rate that your institution is going to charge on your grant is a huge thing to figure out and whether or not it should be allowed that any money that you have going towards students or student support um, activities like travel for students and internships for students that money should not be charged by your university for what they call indirect costs it, it should be excluded from the calculation they call it a modified indirect cost when you take that money out but the best thing to do is I've had my share of 11th hour high blood pressure like panic events where I didn't even know if the proposal was going to make it into grants.gov because my university was going over everything and they like to take two weeks to look over everything um, for that 
uh, before they're going to submit to grants.gov. So there's all these middlemen in between me and grants.gov. I thought I had a deadline. No, my deadline's actually like a month before the real deadline because these your academic institutions have a whole layer of people who are going to be looking and reviewing your proposal and signing off on it. You've got to get all the people who you're working with to sign off on it. And it just, it takes time and planning. So I had a lot of like, uh, just to try to wrap up, I had like those heartburn moments that I think a lot of people have experienced where you have sort of a real bummer situation or a real stress situation with somebody in like your office of sponsored programs who's saying the budget isn't right we won't be able to submit this in time da 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 and so like you're like you know it's easy to want to feel angry at that person and I've heard so many researchers and in faculty you get really frustrated with the personnel in these um, sponsored program offices or these offices at universities that where your research proposals get filtered through the flip side of that that I've learned um, over time is that if I approach them early on and actually ask for help, they have all kinds of resources to guide me on the timing that of how much time I should uh, take, who are people in their office I could work with to review my budget in advance to see if I've done it correctly. And I, I even came to find out that at my, I'm at a small tiny branch campus community college, but I could talk, tap into some services that were available at the giant umbrella um, university because I'm part of a, the system where they actually have staff on board to help review faculty um, uh, your uh, budget justifications. And I learned the proper ways to say, for example, include summer compensation for the work I do in over, like there's tons of summer work because we run all these internship programs and stuff, but I didn't know how that was supposed to be structured in the bu budget or how my time was supposed to be compensated for correctly and I just learned the right way. I see um, a comment that I do think our institutions are trying to kind of get their share, but I've really come full circle to feeling like I have to work with the people there, and if I work with them within a cooperative spirit, they've really actually taught me how to do these things in the right way and um, build more buy-in for the projects. And, and give more of the credit back to the university. It's not just me doing this. The university is actually, they are the ones that provide me the office space and all this stuff, you know. So it is, it, I, I, there was a mindset shift where I started to realize that I was part of a bigger picture. And as much as it was kind of terrifying and definitely stress making to be on those deadlines, I switched gears to really trying to work with all of those uh, people working there because frankly they knew a lot more about their what exactly how I was supposed to do stuff than I did. I know how to like you know teach people certain courses and and do what I wanted to do in my grant but I'm they I needed some guidance and help and it's a lot of people who are just the the brick and mortar, like just like those core people who work behind the scenes as um, at these institutions, you have to make friends with them and work with them because if they don't want to work with you, you're in not a good situation. So I just suggest that you reach out early and develop some humble um, alliances with people in those positions to see if they might help in a way train you of how to do this if you're coming out of the gate just learning how to do these large grants. And then I got the first time, I'll just stay and then I'll see if I have any time left, but the first time I submitted um, I got okay comments but good, basically good try, try again. Second time had, it was like oh, I was going to get it the second time. And then we had all these snafus during that period of time for submittal. And we did not get it in by the 5 p.m. deadline. That was devastating. And the third time was when um, I was able to submit and get the funding for the first project. 
but I will say that that time was by then I got the very most pushback from my administrators because I think it took them three years to realize what I was actually proposing. And they were just terrified that what are you doing and is it going to flop and our name's going to be on it. But at that point I just stood my ground and said, hey, this is going to be good for us. Give me a chance. But I'm just saying that some, and then it has been a very good thing. I can't thank USDA and NEPA enough for all of their support and help. But I guess I, what I really wanted to say to you is that don't give up if things don't go right the first time around and just keep trying and you'll keep learning. Um, and, uh, and, and good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think what we'll do now is we will try answer as many questions as we can from the chat. And if we don't get through them all, we'll make sure to follow up with, um, with you all by email. Um, and then just if there's anything you think about later, just feel free to email Dr. Lawrence or myself and we will get the answers for you. And so to get started, the first question in the chat is um, about indirect costs. Um, and Dr. Lawrence, can the 30% of, is the 30% for indoor costs, the total funds awarded or based on MTDC calculations? Uh, either way, and if you uh, go to our website and you uh, type indirect costs, it give you specific instructions for all, all of those. But I, I just went in into, uh, well, Dr. Santel, thank you very much, by the way, for, uh, helping and being so candid. Um, um, I was listening to your comments and, and, and it's true. Uh, all the things that uh, you have been talking about are, are, are real. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. Um, going back to the questions in direct cost, it's, it's one of the tricky questions. Everybody, every uh, uh, budget office tries to, uh, in the, in, they have their way of interpreting indirect costs. It's cap at 30%. And as the chat shows, you know, the institution wants to get some money out of these and support you. And they want to figure out which way is the one that could get the most. So they're going to go with that form. Um, so, you know, if you go to the website, there's a whole section in indirect costs. Uh, for, and they could talk to you about uh, the specific situation. Um, one thing that I want you to make sure that uh, you think of is there was one grantee that had that situation. They were asking for a lot of money, but the person needed help. So one of the things they did is they negotiated, and this is how you negotiate with the administrators. Okay, can I have a TA to help me with the project? You know. And, you know, sometimes those things were funded and things were funded from the indirect costs, but they were not charged directly to the grant, but the indirect costs, there were some resources within the institution uh, that were given to the project director uh, because, the, you know, they had this indirect cost. And the other, remember when I talk about letters of support, here's where you talk, you know, I'm doing this great project that is gonna help the community it's going to take some effort. There's always a start cost to every project. So this is where you try to negotiate with your administrators. I need some space. You know, I know there's a room over there that it, has, it, doesn't, it doesn't get used as much or there's a lab. And I, we could accommodate these for the students or for, for, you know, for the lab to making things happen. But the, and the whole idea is how do you maximize the ability of the institution and the funds you have or you will be getting uh, to the best project you can. Okay. Um, um, there's a question about the 25 page limit. If you are doing a resubmission letter, is that included in the 25 page limit? Uh, yes, that will be one of the attachments. And you don't have to explain everything. You have to just change the proposal. And I said, we changed, you know, we addressed the comments uh, on page four by adding something or explaining uh, how we're gonna have a project coordinator help the project or whatever the question is. Okay, 
Um, the next question is um, if you could give some guidance on the felony certification form. Uh, it seems like we do actually ask for that form. If you go to the NIFA website and you look for the in the search icon and you type application support templates, you will find a, a template for that form. Next question is, do you fund intensive high quality experiences for small numbers of students, for example, internships? And how many okay, students um, should we impact? Yes, um, we have done that in the past. It's a two year, a, a two year, a two month internship. It costs about $8,000. You know, if you're paying for travel, housing, uh, and a stipend, that's what we have come up with. And how do I, uh, we calculated that. Um, we, uh, we bring students to Bellsville and rooming in a, you know, in a one apartment with four students paying for the travel and a stipend, the amount of money you will need per student is $8,000. However, at the end, Kelly, at the end, we were talking about all these other funding opportunities. Uh, the REEU is one of the opportunities that is specifically designed to give experiential learning to students. So that's another way you could compensate for uh, the limited amount of money that you will have um, with internships. But uh, let me tell you that over the last 20 years, providing internships of students uh, uh, gained big scores on, on the student either going to graduate school or actually uh, landing a job. So uh, very supported and they're very liked by the uh, reviewers. The, I know there's a question on the 25,000 student additional funding. Um, uh, the whole idea is that you could use up to $25,000 to fund a student either at your institution uh, after they finish the project for the next level or to send it to a graduate school. Uh, for example, if it's a two-year student, you know, from a community college, you could move the students to a four-year institution. How, you know, if it's a four-year institution, if it's a four-year student completing a bachelor's degree, then you're moving the student to, um, to a, a graduate school. Okay. Looking through, um, is there a place where um, applicants can find previous grants that were funded? Um, there used to be a, a link on the RFA page to those. I'm not sure it's still there. But, but could they go through Jimra, uh, uh, Kellyanne? Um, I will, I'll try to find out. I know on our the HSI webpage, we do have uh, links to the titles of previous grants, but I don't think we have abstracts or anything else, but I will take a look to see if there's a publicly accessible place for that. Okay. Uh, we used to have them, but I'm not sure uh, they're doing that currently. And we'll check and we'll get back to you. And then um, can K-12 be the beneficiary of the grant? Uh, not the main beneficiary. Uh, but however, when we're talking about recruiting uh, and retention, you could have offered summer programs for the uh, uh, high school students to recruit them into college. Uh, and remember, you know, we're talking about cost effectiveness and budget. All, you know, all these larger grants, we could actually, you know, send some of your students to the K-12 to system to serve as a role models to engage other students, to do practices, into, uh, to do workshops, to make presentations, to do exhi exhibitions. You know, perhaps uh, when things become more normal or closer to where they used to be, you could have a poster session and instead of having it at the uh, university, you could go to a high school and have a poster session and your students uh, reach you know, reach out to all the students and learn. And, 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 and as role models, I think uh, the students at the higher level are very good engaging the students at the younger level. Okay, uh, next question. 
Yeah, there's a general question about developing the budget and um, trying to figure out specific line items. For example, how much can you pay the PI or the students um, and purchasing equipment like soft computers or software? Okay, um, if, you know, if you have students, what is the, you know, there's a work study rate in your institution. I do not recommend you going much more over that. And if you're paying a graduate student, what is the going rate at the institution for the existing uh, forms of support? Uh, I, I think that would be, you know, what I would go uh, with. Um, with the budget, you know, let's say $250,000, um, don't, don't use the money to pay for, you know, just salary staff because you already have staff, you know, and, and, and faculty. Uh, what percentage of the time you really need to run the program? Don't, you know, we could fund equipment, but if you send a list of equipment nicely and you spend $250,000, it's no investment on showing you how some of this money is going to be used to make sure that the equipment is used. You know, it, it would not, you know, this, you know, it, it would not uh, be good. So plan activities um, around, uh, uh, you know, and the budget around making sure you could carry out the, uh, the activities and you could engage the students because after all, that's we're all here for, you know, trying to make the students better, make the communities better. So um, I, I will do that. I will, I will concentrate on that. Um, we have a few questions around um, including budget for traveling. So can you talk about um, the budget for PIs, co-PIs, and the students to travel? And is that travel um, every single year of the conference, of the grant okay. period? Yeah, okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, in my or not might happen is uh, the project director's meeting. I think one of the, uh, we have been, in the past we have gathered a, a yearly. So I recommend you to uh, put in the budget uh, some monies for traveling uh, to Kansas City, D.C., but the location might change. Uh, last year, we met in California. Uh, next year, it's, it's on the TBD, to be decided list. Uh, we, we haven't talked about that yet. We were considering a, a virtual meeting. Uh, but but that's not uh, there yet. However, if you, you know, um, I, I want to talk, uh, we'll talk about the coronavirus and, and, and on the implications that it's changing how we do business, you know, have a plan B. So if we have all this money for travel, we can do that. If by the sec second year, you know, two and a half years, you're not, you, you can, cert you know, be certain of what's going to happen. How could you use that money? and do things different. A virtual meeting instead of um, uh, uh, moving, you know, moving the money for stipends or having the stu students do research um, individually or, or do uh, some computer work, some uh, uh, research on, on the computer. You know, what, how could you use that money so it doesn't uh, go to waste? So, you know, you need to have a plan B in, in right now. We might need a plan C and D. And hopefully that helps. Um, the next question is, is it possible to have the same external evaluator conduct project-related research in addition to the impact evaluation or do they have to be separate people? Uh, no, they, they, they could be the same person. The whole idea is, but we want somebody to be independent, you know, like, when somebody comes from the outside, they, they're better at telling you what's wrong that, and they might see things that you don't see and, and that's the whole idea. But plus, we also want to document your ability to carry out your objectives in, in, and have some outcomes and, you know, at some impact in the, in the in your institution, the students and the community. And then related to that, um, how should they measure the 5% cap? The 5% the cap for evaluation. Uh, it's 5% of the $250,000. And then next, um, a question about including appendices. Um, 
for the 25 pages for the project narrative? Uh, that will be the, uh, the five attachments, the 20 pages plus five attachments. Um, let's see, next will be, um, is equipment purchase allowed in the proposal? Uh, yes, okay. for teaching, not for decoration. <laughs> Not, not to be dusted, you know, you want to show and, you know, you want to get the students there and have the student work with the equipment. And how could they get trained if they don't get to use it? I mean, you have to have some regulations and be careful on not uh, destroying a 25000 or a 50000 or a $100,000 piece of equipment. But how could you work with the students that are ready to work with the equipment to use it? So when they go out to the industry or, or, or the government or, or to the next job, they, they know what to do. And then we have a few questions about collaborating. So for a collaborative project, is it appropriate for a project to have three HSI institutions and one non-HSI non land grant institution? Uh, you need to have at least two HSIs. And if you wanna add a non-HSI, that is uh, perfectly okay. And then related to that, can two institutions collaborate in the regular grant category? Uh, yes. And the whole idea is you're not required, but it definitely can. And in the past, many times you had institutions um, collaborating with, um, you know, during regular projects. Okay. And I think we have three you more have questions. have a program in water quality or animal science that you want to establish that you might want to uh, bring somebody who does, like a big brother, big sister kind of uh, a working relationship. Sorry. Um, no problem. There's a question about, is there a limit to the number of investigators allowed on a regular grant or a collaborative grant? Um, well, at least one, you, need, you should have one person per institution. The whole idea is to include who you need in on the grant and 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 you know and and justify it i know in the last panel we had uh a project had seven copy d's and uh the reviewers were wondering why so many people um and, and you know some you know so the whole idea is how well you justify the involvement and how needed they are um you know another grant they had four people that they were covering the summer salary for four years. And, you know, were those people, you know, necessary and essential to carry out the project? You know, uh, uh, just use your, you know, common sense, have one of your peers read the proposal so they could give you good feedback. The next question is about, um, can USDA fund projects related to the cannabis industry? Uh, if you is that your topic of interest, we have a in-house uh, contact person for the topic. So please send us an email and we'll forward that to uh, Bill Hoffman, who is the NIFA contact person on the topic. And then the last two questions are, can an investigator charge summer salary on a regular grant? Uh, if you're going to be working to carry out the project, yes. And then um, can a postdoc be considered a co-PI on the grant? Yes. Okay. And then one last question. How do the two institutions in the regular grant category share the budget? In the regular, uh, in the regular project, uh, the, the budget goes to, the, to the, the applicant, the lead institution. And the whole idea is whatever that second or collaborating institution uh, has and it requires money, uh, then then you allow you allocate that funding. It doesn't have to be half and half. It is not a specific determination. I think there's like a. I'm not sure if it says it's like a. Ten percent of funds to consider them a, a collaborator, or or. I, I think I read something like that, and, and I have seven projects, I'm confusing them right now. But, you know, it, it, there could be a contractor because, you know, it's a limited amount of work. And and in the other hand, it's not necessarily, um, not necessarily uh, 
a collaborator needs to receive monies. But if they are doing a certain event, let's say housing, a, you, you are in a two-year college and you're in, inviting students uh, to visit a four-year institution and you're gonna house them for a week and there's some cost involved in that, well, obviously that should be part of their budget. Okay, and those are all the questions we have. And um, on the screen, you'll see the last slide again, reminding you about the program code and the CFDA number. And um, just a reminder to, with any further questions, to reach out to Dr. Lawrence or myself, and we'd be happy to answer them. And I will be emailing out copies of the PowerPoint that was shown, as well as a recording of the webinar once we get approval from our communication. Thank, so, thank you so you. much. Thank you to my team, and thank you to uh, Dr. Sanatel for uh, jumping in and uh, giving you some guidance uh, from the other side. Uh, of, of, of the application process, so which is very, very helpful. So thank you and have a great day. Stay well.